Caffeine is arguably one of the best legal performance enhancers around. A single dose of caffeine can significantly improve exercise performance and mental focus. But really, how good is this substance for your body and your health longer term? And what does the science and the real world results have to say about it? Well, in this video, we go over what caffeine is, how it works, and what place it might have in your lifestyle. So stay tuned and don't go anywhere. To understand how caffeine works, we first must understand what caffeine is exactly. Caffeine is a drug. In fact, it's the most used psychoactive drug in the world and it's more widely used than alcohol. Being a stimulant, caffeine works by speeding up the messages traveling between your brain and your body. Caffeine is only found in plants, a lot of plants actually. Beyond tea leaves and coffee beans, there are about 60 plants that contain caffeine. Some flowers even have nectar that contains low levels of caffeine. Here are some of the strongest natural sources of caffeine on the earth today. Coffee is one of the most popular go-tos for a caffeine hit. The more concentrated the form of the coffee, the more caffeinated it is by volume. For instance, a 30 ml espresso shot has around 65 milligrams of caffeine, while the same volume of drip coffee has around 12 milligrams of caffeine. The difference in caffeine content between light and dark roasted coffee beans is minimal. Decaffeinated coffee still has some caffeine in it, but it's quite minimal at around seven milligrams per cup. Many teas also contain caffeine, but there are also many that do not. Teas from the Camellia sinensis plant, such as black, green, white, matcha, oolong, and yerba mate tea, all contain caffeine. However, herbal and fruit infused teas, which are not made from the Camellia sinensis plant, are typically caffeine free. Examples of these include chamomile, rooibos, peppermint, ginger, lemon, and echinacea tea. Cocoa beans and chocolate are another strong natural source of caffeine. Generally speaking, dark chocolate has higher caffeine content than milk chocolate. Guarana is another rich source of caffeine. In fact, the extract, which is made from its seeds, contains four to six times more caffeine than coffee beans. Hence, it's proclivity to be found in energy drinks. Cola nuts are another strong source of caffeine. In fact, one cola nut can contain as much caffeine as two standard cups of coffee. And these nuts are used as flavoring agents in various colas and sodas. Those are some of the strongest natural sources of caffeine. And you're now probably wondering how much caffeine you need to boost performance without suffering any negative side effects. Well, this depends on a few factors and you first need to know how caffeine works and how it is processed by the body. When you consume caffeine, it's quickly absorbed from your gut into your bloodstream. Because caffeine is both water and fat soluble, it can be distributed throughout all of your body's tissues and cross your blood brain barrier. To understand how caffeine takes effect, we need to understand how your body releases energy. Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short, is the main energy currency of your body and the primary source of energy for many cellular functions. Thus, your brain requires ATP to be broken down for its energy requirements. When ATP is broken down, it releases energy and leaves behind adenosine. Adenosine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning that it acts as a central nervous system depressant and inhibits many processes associated with wakefulness. It does this by binding to adenosine receptor sites in your brain. Normally adenosine levels build up over the course of the day and the longer you're awake, the more adenosine builds up. It's this adenosine buildup that is what makes you feel increasingly tired as the day goes on up until bedtime. Once you fall asleep, adenosine is thought to inhibit wake promoting neurons in your brain to deepen your sleep. But gradually over the course of your sleep, your body and your brain starts to convert adenosine back into ATP and this gradually eliminates your sleep drive until you begin to wake up. This is part of your body's natural sleep-wake cycle. So the longer you're awake, the more adenosine builds up in your brain, making you feel tired and sleepy. Caffeine is structurally similar to adenosine and when it enters your system, it competes with adenosine to bind to the same receptors in your brain. However, caffeine doesn't activate these receptors as adenosine does. Instead, it blocks the receptors and prevents adenosine from binding to them. By suppressing the actions of adenosine, caffeine increases neural activity in your brain. This leads to a temporary increase in your mental alertness and thought processing, while also reducing drowsiness and fatigue. This increased neural activity caused by caffeine also stimulates your pituitary gland to secrete hormones. This in turn causes your adrenal glands to produce more adrenaline or epinephrine. This action triggers your body's fight or flight response and your brain's level of alertness and arousal. Caffeine also increases brain activity of the neurotransmitter norepinephrine to further instigate the fight or flight response. And it also increases dopamine, which enhances your overall mood, focus, and motivation. If it's starting to sound like caffeine is a pretty powerful psychiatric drug, then you're not wrong. Let's now take a look at the effects of caffeine on performance. 
Caffeine can enhance your exercise performance by both physical and mental processes. Caffeine can stimulate the release of calcium from your sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a structure within your muscle cells that stores calcium. This release of calcium can lead to more intense muscle contractions and can enhance muscular strength and power. Caffeine's also been shown to increase levels of circulating fatty acids in the body, and this can increase fat utilization for energy. This means that caffeine can help conserve muscle glycogen energy stores and use these for later use. The result of this is that caffeine can help prolong the time it takes your muscles to become fatigued. This glycogen sparing effect of caffeine is particularly beneficial during endurance exercise, where maintaining energy supply over a long period of time is crucial. However, it's important to note here that this performance increase is not from overall energy demands increasing, but rather from better energy utilization towards fat and away from glycogen. So although caffeine is often sold as a fat burner, the extra amount of overall body fat that is oxidized whilst using it is quite negligible. Also, the extra energy from its thermic effect or ability to raise your body temperature is also quite small. So don't be fooled by fat burners that often make this claim about caffeine. Any attributable enhancement of fat loss whilst consuming caffeine around exercise more lies in caffeine's effect on overall performance that drives up energy demands rather than the breakdown of the energy utilization between glucose and fat. And how can caffeine drive up energy demands and increase exercise intensity? Well, it's a powerful nervous system stimulator. Although caffeine can increase dopamine levels and boost arousal for both cognitive and physical tasks, it's a primary mechanism of blocking adenosine and activating your body's fight or flight response that makes caffeine a powerful performance enhancer. This instigation of your fight or flight response is what leads to increases in heart rate, blood pressure and blood flow to your muscles. Instigating this mechanism can also increase alertness and focus and thus improve a person's reaction time. And this is important to remember because these increases in reaction time are not achieved by an increase in motor ability, but rather by an increase in mental attention. This fight or flight mechanism also reduces the perception of pain and effort, allowing you to push even harder and longer. An important word I used in that previous sentence is perception. By blocking adenosine receptors and stimulating the central nervous system, caffeine reduces our perception of fatigue and effort, making exercise feel less strenuous. However, the exercise is not actually less strenuous. This is an important clarification because despite what some energy drink companies tell you, caffeine does not give you energy. It simply masks fatigue. And we'll talk more about this important distinction a little bit later on, but for now, let's talk about the optimal dosage and timing of caffeine. For increased physical performance, most research suggests that people take a dose of around three to six milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight and take it about an hour before exercise. However, some more recent studies have found that lower doses of around two to three milligrams per kilogram of body weight can be highly effective when taken at the onset of fatigue. When it comes to overall intake, most people can tolerate around 400 milligrams of caffeine per day, which is about three to four standard cups of coffee. Caffeine's peak saturation levels and effects on adenosine receptors occur as quickly as 15 minutes and on average about 45 minutes after ingestion. It's worth noting too, that if you have caffeine within one to two hours of waking up, you're blocking the natural conversion of adenosine back into ATP. Thus, you would have more heightened alertness and less tiredness during the day if your morning coffee was not consumed straight after you got out of bed, but instead was pushed back to later in the morning. But before you go out and dose up on caffeine, there are some side effects and drawbacks that you need to know about this drug as well. Having 400 milligrams of caffeine might not seem like a lot to some people, but beyond obvious items like tea, coffee, chocolate, and energy drinks, when you consider how caffeine is finding its way into so many products nowadays, it's not hard to overdo it with caffeine. Here are some of the less obvious products that caffeine can be added to. Ice cream and frozen yogurts, sodas and fruit juices, candies, mints, and chewing gums, over-the-counter and prescription pain relievers and cold medicines, sports drinks and bottled water, energy bars and snacks, meal replacement shakes, supplements, and diet pills. Some of the immediate side effects of caffeine include things like the jitters, a racing heart rate, digestive distress, increased urination and incontinence, headaches, and trouble sleeping. With regular caffeine consumption, there are also some not so good longer term effects as well. Caffeine is by nature a highly addictive drug and it's easy to become dependent on it. Dependent to the point where most people can't seem to function or mentally cope without it. Thus, it's not uncommon for those addicted to caffeine to get clinically anxious without it. Long-term caffeine use can also lead to chronic insomnia and a vicious cycle of dependency on caffeine to stay awake and get by. Caffeine interferes with your circadian rhythm and natural sleep drive in a few different ways. 
Along with interfering with your adenosine receptors, caffeine reduces both your slow wave sleep and your REM sleep. Also, very few people take into consideration caffeine's half-life, which can be increased significantly by the dose. For instance, if you have a typical dose of around 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine, this has a five to six hour half-life, which means that half of the caffeine you consume will be in your system five to six hours later. However, if you have a larger dose of around 600 milligrams, this might stay in your system as much as three hours longer. It gets worse though. For the average person, caffeine has a quarter life of 10 to 12 hours. So if you have a coffee at lunchtime, that caffeine is still in your system around midnight. And that's if you're on the lower end of the caffeine intake levels. This obviously has a big impact on your sleep quality and quantity, even if you consume caffeine earlier in the day. But it doesn't stop there. Caffeine delays melatonin release, which is a hormone that regulates your sleep-wake cycle and tells you when to go to bed. Caffeine also directly affects the messenger molecule called cyclic AMP, which plays a key role in maintaining your circadian rhythm. And it's not just your brain, but also your body that caffeine can have a profound effect on. Few people realize that caffeine can interfere with the body's absorption and excretion of calcium. Moderate to high doses of caffeine can inhibit the absorption of calcium in the intestines and also increase the amount of calcium lost in the urine, which can potentially affect bone health. Caffeine can also be an irritant in several ways. When it comes to your stomach, caffeine can increase stomach acid production through several mechanisms. It can stimulate the release of gastrin, a hormone that increases stomach acid production. It can reduce the production of somatostatin, a hormone that inhibits the release of stomach acids. And it can also increase the stress hormones cortisol and epinephrine, which too can increase secretion of stomach acids. This buildup of stomach acid is what often leads to heartburn, indigestion, or an upset stomach when consuming caffeine. And it's not just ingesting caffeine that causes issues, excreting it also gives most people grief. Caffeine stimulates urine production and acts as a diuretic through several mechanisms. It increases blood flow to your kidneys, which in turn increases the kidney's filtration rate. It also reduces the absorption of water and sodium, leading to an increase in urine production. And caffeine also inhibits your antidiuretic hormone, which is responsible for regulating body water. And to top it off, caffeine increases bladder contractions and irritates the bladder lining. This causes increased bladder sensations and urges to urinate. Thus, with enough of a dose, it's easy to see how caffeine can cause dehydration. And the dose is different for each person. Some people are genetically more susceptible to caffeine than others. A person's size, their metabolic rate, and their overall health status can influence their tolerance levels to caffeine. And maybe you've noticed and tolerated many of these negative side effects of caffeine yourself. An easy way to get rid of the symptoms would be to simply cut back or eliminate the caffeine. However, the problem with caffeine is that it's so addictive and it's not exactly an easy thing to give up. Most people who try and quit regular coffee drinking or caffeine use, even for a couple of days, usually get significant withdrawal symptoms, or worse yet, complete crushes. And you don't have to quit caffeine to know you're addicted either. You can hear it in your language. Saying that you need a coffee instead of saying that you're tired is usually a telling sign. With all that said, it sounds like caffeine isn't as good for you as what many people say. To make matters worse, there are many big food and beverage companies that have a vested interest in the sale of their caffeinated products. This is especially true when it comes to soft drink companies like Coca-Cola, coffee companies like Nestle, and energy drink manufacturers like Red Bull. These companies have huge marketing budgets for getting their products in front of people and often fund and release research that favors their products. But I can assure you that despite what many studies purport, Caffeine has no health benefits and no nutritional value. It's a plant poison designed to deter insects and make natural insecticides more potent. A more important contention though, is whether it's actually good to be stimulating your fight or flight response all the time with caffeine. In my view, the less caffeine you can get by with, the better. Which brings me to the part of the video where I explain why I quit caffeine and how. When it comes to caffeine, for me, the cons grossly outweigh the pros. For a bit of background, my dependence to caffeine started when I became a trainer who used to get up at 4am every morning for client sessions and finish as late as 9pm each day. Week in and week out for over a decade, caffeine had been directly connected to how I worked and without it, I found it very hard to function. Caffeine also highly compromised my sleep, even when I was only taking a small amount of it. And sleep's pretty important. A lack of sleep quantity and quality will shorten your lifespan. There's no doubt about that. Caffeine was also messing up my gut and causing excessive motility and bathroom trips. Not to mention the pent up anxiety caffeine used to give me when it started to wear off. And for all the stimulating benefits of caffeine, the truth is it was making me permanently tired and exhausted. In fact, the irony with caffeine is that the people who take it the most are supposed to be the most lively. But when you look at anyone who has a caffeine addiction, 
they're the ones who actually look the most tired and run down all the time. And that's the caffeine trap. The one thing caffeine addicts need to return to their energetic selves is the removal of the one thing they are relying upon to function, caffeine. But as I said earlier, it's not an easy thing to give up. Before I gave up caffeine entirely, I tried to cut back to a small amount instead of giving it away completely. At that time, I was only having around 150 milligrams of caffeine per day, but even that was too much. I even gradually dialed it down to less than one cup of coffee per day. However, for the average person, even a small 60 milligram dose of caffeine can keep you alert for several hours afterwards. At the time, I was often having my caffeine just before workouts late in the morning, but struggling to sleep properly 10 to 12 hours later on. The other problem with caffeine is that you can develop a tolerance to it, meaning that more and more caffeine is required to produce the same effect. So cutting back on caffeine didn't really work for me, as it always left the door open for more to get the same effect. The first time I tried quitting caffeine cold turkey was while I was working, but that didn't work. In fact, that was a problem. Often my work performance and even my workout performance was tied to my caffeine intake. And when you go off caffeine, your willpower's in an all-time low because you're trying to fight off the addiction and so your willpower for doing many other things in life goes down as well. Caffeine's also good at suppressing appetite and hunger, so notice my eating habits were harder to maintain without caffeine and I craved a lot more food than when I was on caffeine. To succeed in fully quitting, I actually had to wait till I was on a holiday. This way I could deal with the withdrawals and the energy crashes from the energy debt that I'd accumulated and built up in my system for so long. I'd have to say that quitting caffeine was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I've given up sugar and booze, and these were quite hard, but caffeine was on another level. Not just because it's highly addictive, but also because the withdrawals are so strong. However, the short-term pain was definitely worth the long-term gain. My digestion remarkably improved, my sleep and recovery got increasingly better to the point where I'd never wake up tired or during the night like I used to, and my energy levels also were far more stable. When I was on caffeine, I'd get bursts of energy at weird times which actually makes sense in hindsight, because if you get a high from caffeine, you're naturally gonna get a crash. And without caffeine, I also feel so much more relaxed and nowhere near as anxious about work and life stresses anymore. So in my view, if you can find a way to quit caffeine, you probably should. If you're skeptical, try life without it for a while and get back to me about how you feel. And I know not everyone takes caffeine because they want to. You could be a shift worker or a new parent who struggles to get quality rest at times. But with that said too, it's also okay to be tired from time to time. It's part of being a human being and it's usually a sign that you need more rest. If you're chronically tired too, using caffeine to mask it all the time never gives you any insight into why you're tired. You never really question things like whether there's something going on with your diet, whether you're getting enough sleep, whether you're dealing with stress properly, or whether you're drinking too much. There are many things that can cause you to be tired and using caffeine to deal with the symptoms all the time is not a remedy. It simply masks the problem. Oh, and on the point of alcohol, if you consume alcohol, you're statistically more likely to consume caffeine. If you're wondering why, check out this other video of mine which I'll put up on the screen. Do let me know though what your thoughts are on caffeine by leaving a comment below about your experiences with it. I hope you got a lot out of this video and feel free to tap the like button and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. That's all from me for today on caffeine. Give this drug a lot of thought and I'll see you next time.